This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Lights in the Distance, Exile and Refuge at the Borders of Europe by Daniel Trilling. A mother puts her children into a refrigerator truck and asks, what else could I do? A runaway teenager comes of age on the streets, sleeping in abandoned buildings. A student leaves his war-ravaged country behind because he doesn't want to kill. Everyone among the thousands of people who come to Europe in search of asylum each year possesses a unique story. But those stories don't end as they cross into the West. In Lights in the Distance, acclaimed journalist Daniel Trilling draws on years of reporting to build a portrait of the refugee crisis as seen through the eyes of the people who experienced it firsthand. As the European Union has grown, so has a tangled and often violent system designed to filter out unwanted migrants. Visiting camps and hostels, sneaking into detention centers, and delving into his own family's history of displacement, Trilling weaves together the stories of people he met and followed from country to country. In doing so, he shows that the terms commonly used to define them, refugee or economic migrant, legal or illegal, deserving or undeserving, fall woefully short of capturing the complex realities. The founding story of the EU is that it exists to ensure the horrors of the 20th century are never repeated. Now, as it comes to terms with the worst refugee crisis since the Second World War, its declared values of freedom, tolerance, and respect for human rights are being put to the test. Lights in the Distance is a uniquely powerful and illuminating exploration of the nature and human dimensions of the crisis. Lights in the Distance, Exile and Refuge at the Borders of Europe by Daniel Trilling. Out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. If you can't beat them, join them. Hillary Clinton just stated that Europe needs to get a handle on migration because that is what lit the flame of the ascendant far right. This obscures, of course, not only the economic crises her brand of politics created, but also the fact that Syrian, Iraqi, and Afghan refugees are fleeing violent conflicts that she energetically voted into existence. The New York Times noted that her remarks were greeted with a dose of surprise, though they shouldn't have been. Bill Clinton pioneered a new Democrat strategy— that in the 1990s took on anti-immigrant politics with the aim of outflanking the nativist right. He signed legislation to facilitate deportations, doubled the size of the border patrol, and declared that, quote, we won't tolerate immigration by people whose first act is to break the law as they enter our country. Hillary recapitulated the same law and order nationalism as U.S. Senator, voting to build hundreds of miles of fencing along the border and taking a strident line against those who dared cross it. Conservative commentator and former Newt Gingrich press secretary Tony Blankley praised her rhetoric as Pat Buchanan-esque. Quote, I never thought I would write the following words, but God bless Hillary Clinton. There's no cause for surprise at Clinton's remarks then, save for historical amnesia in part enabled by her woke rebranding during the 2016 primaries. Last week, Clinton reminded us that American neoliberalism, despite its ad copy shilling a gospel of market-based human thriving, has always been made possible by repression, from border militarization to mass incarceration. Free movement for capital, walls and cages for workers. That reminder was poorly timed for self-professed leftist Angela Nagel, who published an essay the very same week, contending that support for immigration was part of a, quote, neoliberal attack on national barriers to the flow of labor and capital, and that the American left should embrace a crackdown on undocumented workers to defend the economic interests of working-class Americans and to ensure their political allegiance. She made this argument in an essay addressed to the left, yet tellingly published in American Affairs magazine, 
which Politico described as a, quote, pro-Trump journal launched in an effort to give the Trump movement some intellectual heft. The so-called left case against immigration is what I'm discussing today with my guest, Richard Seymour, who recently wrote an excellent critique of anti-migrant politics on the German left. But first, a few more thoughts by way of introduction. American Affairs, of course, was a fitting venue for Nagel because the unstated upshot of her argument is a political program to mobilize white Americans against workers of color, particularly Latinos. And this is precisely what Trump, with that bitter goblin Stephen Miller whispering in his ear, claims to be doing. Also fitting was her appearance on Tucker Carlson's Ideological Slaughterhouse, where left-wing ideas are customarily severed from all context so as to be rendered into red meat for right-wing viewers. He just couldn't believe that he found himself agreeing with a leftist, praising Nagel for her braveness, and also Clinton for being onto something. Something indeed. Nagel went on to blame media elites for manufacturing open border politics on the left, as conservative triggering footage of immigrants rushing the southern border played alongside her. And one of the most bewildering things in the last couple of years is watching, not people on the, the actual left, I think you're on the actual left, but the sort of American liberal left, taking the side of Tyson's chicken or some other big employer, in effect. When did that happen? When did that change take place? I'm not exactly sure when it happened, but like a lot of these things, uh, you know, there, there is this kind of um, um, bubble uh, around the media class who uh, change a position on something overnight and then the rest of the world wakes up and finds that this moral taboo has been erected kind of overnight. Uh, but, you know, as I said in the piece, um, you know, billionaire funded free market think tanks have been churning out uh, open borders ideology for years now. Um, and it's uh, it, it's a shame that um, that people on the who should be offering an alternative uh, that places, um, you know, the, the, the lot of workers um, at its center. But She's also the- not exactly sure. That is for sure. But her wink at something proximate to George Soros migrant caravan conspiracism, intended or accidental, sure got a chuckle out of Tucker. I have a few thousand words on this subject coming out later this week at N plus one. For now, I'll provide just a brief overview of how Nagel, thrilled by her own transgression, evinces staggering ignorance of the history of the left debate over migration, the relationship between neoliberalism and repression, and really the entire history of immigration politics. Nagel contends that, quote, open borders has long been a rallying cry of the business and free market right. Drawing from neoclassical economists, these groups have advocated for liberalizing migration on the grounds of market rationality and economic freedom. This would have startled Margaret Thatcher, who called for a near total end to immigration. Or George W. Bush, who signed the law to build hundreds of miles of border fencing and who presided over massive raids to seize and deport undocumented workers. Of course, business wants to exploit migrant labor. But the implementation of neoliberalism has always gone hand in hand with repression from mass incarceration to the militarization of borders. But Nagel insists that, quote, Today's well-intentioned activists have become the useful idiots of big business. To make her case, Nagel turns to George J. Borjas, a staunchly conservative and, gasp, neoclassical economist, to argue that immigration functions as a kind of upward wealth redistribution. I explore Borjas's economic arguments and what Nagel makes of them in greater detail in my forthcoming N plus one essay. But... I'll note now not only that Borjas' findings are extraordinarily controversial within labor economics, but also that it's utterly astounding that anyone who claims to be on the left blames competition from one group of criminalized low-wage workers in a racially segmented labor market rather than capitalist exploitation and domination for the existence of low wages. And interestingly... Nagel doesn't cite Borjas' proclamation that communism is evil, or his favorable comparison of Trump to Obama, who he mused, quote, sure seems to be friendly with some very unsavory characters. Unsurprisingly, 
Borjas, who condemns his critics for peddling fake news, is a favored economist of Stephen Miller and also Jeff Sessions, who, in his Senate confirmation hearing, called Borjas with perfectly pitched Trumpian hyperbole, quote, the world's perhaps most effective and knowledgeable scholar. The feeling was mutual. Borjas, enthusiastically endorsing Sessions as Trump's pick for attorney general, called him a Southern gentleman. Arguably, the most mind-bendingly and demonstrably false part of Nagel's essay is her assertion that, quote, the transformation of open borders into a left position is a very new phenomenon and runs counter to the history of the organized left in fundamental ways. That's just plain false, as in factually incorrect. Historically, the most radical tendencies of socialist and labor movements in the United States and elsewhere have long stood for immigrant rights. As Lenin wrote in a critique of socialists who supported immigration restriction, quote, such socialists are in reality jingos. In fact, it's the political program that Nagel argues for that is fundamentally counter to the left because her political program necessarily envisions an objectively reactionary social base, a violently nostalgic white cross-class nationalist alliance. This, of course, is no road to socialism. Left power in the United States is and must be rooted in a multiracial working class majority. Nagel's argument isn't socialist, but rather conservatively social democratic. But its function is to legitimate a radical xenophobia at the very center of a right wing government in power. Who, Nagel should ask herself, is the useful idiot? Before we get this interview started, we work hard to bring you the analysis from smart thinkers on the left that you need to understand the world in order to change it. And we can do so only thanks to your support at patreon.com slash the dig. $5 a month gets you access to our newsletter. $10 gets you a copy of either Assad Hater's Mistaken Identity or Jacobin's ABCs of Socialism. $20 or more, and we will send you a load of left-wing books. And so please, if you appreciate what we're doing here at The Dig, make a contribution at patreon.com slash the dig to ensure that we can keep doing it. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Thank you. And here's Richard Seymour, a founding editor of Salvage and the author of a number of books, including Corbin, the Strange Rebirth of Radical Politics from Verso. He is also in on this Patreon game, and you can find tons of his writing and support him at patreon.com slash Richard Seymour WTF. That's patreon.com slash Richard Seymour WTF. <laughs> Richard Seymour, welcome back to The Dig. Thank you for having me. Angela Nagel's argument that the U.S. left should embrace immigration restriction and a crackdown on undocumented immigrants really echoes what's been happening in Germany, where Wolfgang Streeck and Sarah Wagenknecht and others from the left party, or Die Linke, created a new formation called Altesen, which is doing precisely what Nagel proposes— attempting to co-opt the far-right xenophobia. Yeah. Before we get into critiquing this politics on the merits, can you explain what's been happening on the German left? Well, I mean, I, I know about uh, as much about it as, uh, as as most on the left do, in as much as I'm a sort of interested follower, but I'm by no means an expert. Uh, my sense of what's happening and what's been happening for some time uh, is that the uh, Dailinka has been struggling uh, to build, and uh, it's been struggling to advance on a traditionally leftist agenda, whereas uh, the alternative for Deutschland and uh, uh, sort of this uh, new far-right formation has been building support precisely in the areas um, of the sort of formerly Stalinist East, um, you know, very working-class areas often, um, 
very socially conservative parts of them, um, uh, that the uh, Dalinko had built up support in. And so there's a feeling, um, and this is being driven in part by Oscar Lafontaine, who uh, has, uh, you know, I mean, he's got uh, a decent left record on some issues. Uh, but uh, when it comes to immigration, he's he's played the, the sort of opportunistic politics with this before. So Oscar Lafontaine, Sarah Wagenknecht, uh, and I mean Wolfgang Streak. I would just say um, I, I noticed that in none of his writing on this, he doesn't advance um, the kind of argument that Nagel does. Uh, Nagel argues that immigration um, reduces the bargaining power and wage earning power of uh, workers. Uh, I don't see that in Streak. I, uh, he seems to be much more concerned. I mean, he may argue this somewhere, but what I've seen, he seems to be much more concerned about um, the cultural effects of the left, uh, the cultural and political effects of the left adopting an open borders policy, which would seem to place it at odds with the working class base. So it's a much more overtly opportunistic position. Um, and the interesting thing about it is, is they talk about it as if, uh, and this is what struck me about uh, Wolfgang Streak's uh, recent article, talk about it as if they are um, deflating the hysteria, they're moving on, they're, you know, they're not going to make a big deal out of these uh, grandstanding policy issues like immigration. You know, they, they, that's their big differentia specifica. That's the thing that they're talking about. They're not driving it down the agenda, they're driving it up the agenda to that extent, I fear. They're validating the far right. But I, I, uh, deviated somewhat slightly from the narrow path you set me, which was not to comment on the uh, merits or demerits. So, I mean, just um, I think this is a result of um, an impasse on uh, the German left and their inability to cope with uh, Merkel, who has played very effectively the game of keeping German capitalism afloat at the expense of other capital states within the European Union, especially within the Eurozone, um, and has uh, kept a large part of the working class uh, support on side, and they haven't really been able to benefit from the implosion of the Social Democratic Party. Uh, no doubt in part because uh, a large part of Dalinka wants to keep uh, going into coalitions with uh, the SPD um, locally. And so, you know, I think this is a strategic difficulty that uh, they've worked themselves into, um, not entirely of their doing, but partly of their doing, which is now being addressed through this uh, displacement activity of uh, scapegoating immigration. Do they represent a majority position within Delinka? I suppose not, since they had to create an alternative formation. No, they, I mean, the, their positions were voted down. Wagenknecht's um, uh, views were um, very sharply repudiated. And it has to be said, um, whatever you think of uh, her opponents, and I I don't know enough about them. I have been told by people who do know that there's a slightly moralistic bent to the critique. Um, but even with that said, the way in which they uh, have denigrated their opponents, um, uh, the the ways in which they represent them as you know they're not uh, they're not serious working class activists, they're middle class idealists, and so on, it, playing into these really Trumpian political figures. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, that's not designed to win people over. That's uh, intrinsically designed to polarize and to alienate people. Uh, whether they meant to do that or not is another issue, but it suggests they're looking for a different kind of coalition. Um, and, you know, the the phrase red-brown is thrown around a lot um, with uh, reckless abandon um, and uh, is uh, obviously a particular theme of the alt-center. Uh, so we should be careful about uh, raising uh, that specter. But, you know, I would just like to say that the, the, this, is, um, this is a possibility. It's a tendency we could see emerge. I don't think that's what's going on here precisely, but uh, we should be very wary of that as a potential in this situation, particularly since globally fascism is doing a lot better uh, than the left. You write that Wagenknecht and Streak and company take a certain thrill 
in what they see as a transgression of political correctness, breaking this taboo by talking about that which is ostensibly verboten. And I get something similar from Nagel and her supporters. What does this spirit of transgression reveal, given that what they are proposing is that the left simply mimic the anti-immigrant politics that have been mainstream politics for quite a long time in both the U.S. and Europe? My feeling about, um, I guess, those who might identify themselves as Nagelites, uh, in the in the spirit of uh, I'm Spartacus, uh, there might be a bunch of um, right-wing social democrats out there just declaring themselves Nagelites. My feeling about them is that they uh, are fueled by um, and uh, dependent on a kind of SJW uh, virulent uh, moralistic attack, and they're sort of trapped in the same kind of logic. Um, so they engage in essentially what is trolling. I mean, why did Nagel decide to run this piece or, go, or, or seek for this piece uh, a Trumpite publication? I mean, I, my guess is uh, partly it's because no serious <laughs> left publication would, would carry it. But uh, I think there's an element of trolling in that. I think it's a provocation. And I think that um, we're supposed to be, become very outraged and say, ah, well, you see, we 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 saw we saw where Nagel was going all along. She was going to the red brown corner, and there she is. And I say this: I have none of the um, animus against Nagel that many people, particularly on the American left, do. Uh, I think that um, her book had a lot of flaws, but some of it was interesting. Um, I'm sure that uh, some of what she says is valuable. But in this piece, all I see is that we're supposed to be stunned by the repetition of ancient tropes. This stuff has been said again and again, and it's been dealt with again and again. I mean, let's go through some of the claims that she makes. She claims that Cesar Chavez, you know, as a, as a hero of the closed borders left. Okay, for a period of time, that was his position. He migrated to a different position. He shifted positions. Why? He shifted positions because practically the entire... Um, uh, uh, sort of migrant workers movement wanted um, uh, legalization for workers and he came to support amnesty. So, you know, she's citing him uh, without noting that he shifted his position. Uh, she claims that open borders is some relatively novel position on the history of the left that we've never heard this before. I, I, do, she don't, I don't think she knows what she's talking about. Anybody who um, uh, picks up Satnam Verdi's book, um, Race, Racism and the Racialized Outsider, well, look, it's a history of the British left from precisely the point of view of what happens to race on the British left. And it shows that again and again, uh, the position of uh, welcoming migrants has come to the fore when the left has been doing well and when it has gained an internationalist leadership. So, for example... You know, it was Eleanor Marx and the first international who had a fight with Henry Hindman precisely over his support for immigration controls. Um, you know, it, or take uh, the Chartist leaders. Many of their leaders were, were immigrant workers themselves. Border co controls today, on the other hand, are vastly different, far more elaborate and violent bureaucracies than anything seen in that era. So the idea that you you know, go back and say, well, these guys weren't uh, obsessed with border controls. And certainly I, I don't think you would find them using that precise phrase. But um, the idea that you can go back and say, well, they don't have the same obsession today as as people do today. Uh, well, there's a reason for that. The situation is different. Globally, border controls have never been more extensive. In both the United States and Europe and the U.S., border militarization is a constitutive feature of neoliberal political economy, so is mass incarceration. But yeah. she makes it seem like economic liberals more generally are entirely sincerely for the the equal free movement of both labor and capital. But that that's obviously not the history that, that we've lived through. Well, look, I mean, uh, the thing about it is, is that free movement is a phrase with no meaning uh, extricated from uh, a political economy. So though there are economic liberals, um, neoliberals, um, who support um, some sort of open borders position, 
um, they don't have much uh, support within national states. They don't have, I'm, I'm talking here about actual state administrations, but nonetheless, they exist. But what they support is a form of free movement built, uh, built into a system that uh, is structured around um, uh, intensified competition, privatization, flexibility. Uh, precariatization and so on um so you know i mean of course uh, if you um if you were a neoliberal um it would make a certain degree of sense um to i mean certainly on the libertarian wing to support uh, that as part of uh, a counterinflationary flexible uh, privatized union busting policy but then even then the people who lose out from that by and large, I'm talking about uh, in, when you have uh, free movement in, in that kind of a system, are not native workers, as it were, um, putting that term native very much in inverted quotes, um, but rather, and this is the what the research shows in the European Union, rather it's other migrant workers. And that's it's, it's intended to be that way. So, you know, there's absolutely uh, zero evidence for any significant aggregate impact of migration, and I'm talking about the econometric studies from the UK, I'm talking about the European Union, and to the best of my knowledge, the same applies in the US. Absolutely little uh, to no, no serious evidence of uh, a, a major impact on uh, wages or employment uh, among so-called native workers. So uh, where is this coming from? Um, and, you know, I, I've noticed uh, that uh, her argument cites a conservative economist, probably one of the few economists who would actually uh, make this claim. But I used to uh, teach this stuff um, uh, at the uh, London School of Economics. And the overwhelming burden of the literature is that uh, the any effect, insofar as there is an effect at all, is extraordinarily weak and localized. As you just hinted out, you, you do write about how the politics of, of, of xenophobia are often only very indirectly related to the actual reality of immigration. And and you point to the relatively yeah. small number of migrants to Europe, given the overall size of the population and the fact that many AFD voters are from areas of Germany with the smallest number of migrants. And uh -huh. you write, quote, to put it bluntly, whatever immigration regime you have, there will always be people falsely blaming social problems on immigration. Not because it's the fault of immigration, but because some people are xenophobic or racist. Why should the left give ground to this? I think what's important about your emphasis here on the disconnect between migrant politics and actual migration is that it reveals that these arguments for this pragmatic left xenophobia from Nagel and, and from others, that they aren't really that pragmatic at all because they rest on this false belief that there's a solution to the problem of immigration that once implemented will finally deactivate people's xenophobia. But but that's not how it works, is it? <laughs> Here, here's the thing about this. What they are concretely recommending, and I looked at... Um, uh, Nagel's article here, and I'm, I'm thinking in terms of what Wolfgang Schreck was proposing or um, uh, hinting at as well, and what Sarah Wagenknecht has written. Um, what they're proposing concretely is intensified segregation, segmentation of the labor market, which has well-known and predictable effects in uh, reducing the bargaining power of labor and increasing the exploitability and therefore the uh, total rate of exploitation of migrant workers. Now, there's a useful model, I think, for studying how migrant economies work around these kinds of restrictions. Wolpe um, was a Marxist uh, writing about South Africa, uh, and he conducted a study of migrant labour and pre-apartheid segregation. And what he pointed out was that uh, the reason why um, you could have uh, migration as so-called cheap labor in South Africa was because you had the juxtaposition within the same national state um, or the same national economy of different economies. Now, he was talking about uh, the juxtaposition of, say, a pre-capitalist economy and a capitalist economy um, in the sort of in the mining capitalist uh, zones, you know. And the idea was essentially that you could uh, ship in workers from the rural uh, hinterlands, uh, you would house them collectively, 
you would feed them collectively, you would transport them collectively, and you would pay them less. Um, you would by creating a collar bar, and well, that's what they did. So you've reduced the cost of labor uh, on all fronts in terms of the cost of the reproduction of labor power uh, being much cheaper. But you also have one other factor, which is, of course, they, of course, have families to feed. Uh, that's why they've migrated to uh, do some work. But their families exist and subsist in pre-capitalist economies, uh, and they cost much less to reduce. Well, obviously, you can't just transplant that model into the 21st century. But I think it offers some useful criteria for looking at how it may be that you can have a situation in which, say, in the UK, after migrants from the A8 countries, these are the countries uh, that uh, are of the east of Europe that were admitted to the European Union, and then uh, migrants from those countries were admitted to other parts of the European Union, and finally to the UK. The UK was the last holdout, as far as I know. Um, well, what happened was was rather than them uh, taking uh, from a, a fixed pool of jobs and wages, net employment significantly increased. Right. Um, so why did that happen despite uh, they, these workers being uh, significantly cheaper? Well, you can look at what happened. They were, by and large, especially those who moved on a sort of, um, uh, you might say, a uh, a precarious basis, unsure of their rights, not linked to trade unions, uh, shipped in by uh, you know firms uh, wanting to use them for uh, very menial work in rural areas, uh, uh, sort of uh, picking vegetables or fruits in uh, farmland or working in hotels or whatever else that happens to be. Um, well, uh, they were housed collectively. Um, this still happens uh, often, um, uh, transported collectively. Um, and of course, the cost of reproducing labor back in, for example, Warsaw or Bucharest is significantly less than the cost of reproducing labor in uh, London or Birmingham or Manchester. So you can have a situation in which new jobs can be created for migrant workers that couldn't be created for uh, workers located in the UK. Now, if you wanted to address that, um, you would have to do two things. First of all, you would have to uh, actually increase the rights of those migrant workers and get them organized. And uh, the, for, for a long time, the trade unions in this country had a decent policy on this. They have sought to organize uh, migrant workers. Um, and uh, there are plenty of uh, union activists who are still doing that work. Um, but the other thing you would have to do, of course, is restructure the economy. And attack the segmented labor market. And the the odd thing, exactly. the, the odd thing about Nagel and Company is that the forces that are segmenting the labor market appear, I guess, in like mystified form to them, and they see the the workers on the bottom rungs of the segmented labor market as sort of an inherent wage threat rather than the product of the segmented labor market. It's almost like how under slavery and American racial capitalism after slavery um, to the present in many, many ways. We have a racially segmented labor market with black workers at the bottom. And it would be very odd to blame black workers' blackness rather than the intersection of racism and capitalism for the resulting labor market segmentation and its negative effect on workers of all races. It seems to me that um, if you uh, were to uh, take the European Union and uh, keep everything else exactly as it is and then uh, get rid of free movement so that workers had to stay in the national state where they have uh, citizenship. So you abolish EU citizenship, you abolish free movement and workers have to stay where they are. Well, of course, one of the things that's going to happen is that uh, a lot of workers in poorer economies are going to uh, end up with far less bargaining power because there will be a much bigger glut of labor in those societies. Um, this uh, It's not just that they're mystifying um, something here. It's that their um, precept is intrinsically nationalistic. Um, uh, the, the methodological nationalism is very obvious here because... I mean, they may assume 
I, I don't think they're right in this, but they may assume that American workers, if there were tighter border controls, would be able to organize uh, better and have stronger bargaining power and all the rest of it. They may make that assumption, but are they making that, the assumption that uh, those workers who uh, remain stuck in Mexico or Guatemala uh, or elsewhere in the global economy uh, are going to be better off? I mean, it, the, the implication is that their interests aren't really being taken into account. I mean, um, and, you know, one of the major factors uh, for redistribution in world um, in the world economy is precisely migration, because if you can uh, have groups of workers migrating to where they can find work um, uh, and uh, build up uh, some money and savings and send it back home, you know, that's the result. That's the cause of the transfer of billions, um, uh, you know, globally. If I was interested in, if I was a socialist, which I am, and an internationalist, which I am, uh, and interest, interested in class solidarity and not nationalism, which is uh, where I'd like to be, uh, then I think that uh, you have to support um, the expansion of this system of uh, wealth redistribution. You have to support the suppression of the means by which workers migrating to where there is work or where they can potentially find work are being subject to precarianization, are being subject to various forms of flexibilization, uh, are being subject to criminalization. I mean, I think you've pointed out, uh, if not here, then elsewhere, that um, one of the things uh, that uh, will happen if you um, tighten up border controls is not a, a net reduction of migration. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is the criminalization and further precarization of those groups of workers. In other words, it's the racial stratification of the global labor force, uh, which socialists have to be four square against. And then this brings us to a, a larger methodological and political issue which is, do you think, uh, what do you think the role of race in politics is and has been? I think historically, um, it's pretty obvious that the, the role of race in class politics has been to um, weaken um, the bargaining power of organized labor by precisely stratifying it and segmenting it in various different ways, um, and by creating a, a, a special caste or class of uh, people who can be subject to more intensified exploitation, who can be given fewer wages, and by uh, compensating others for their reduced bargaining power with uh, what uh, I suppose David Rodiger, following uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, would call a, a social and psychological wage, a set of sort of um, compensations uh, or they, that are linked to whiteness, you know. Which is something that Marx very clearly points out in in a passage that Nagel oddly quotes because it doesn't serve her argument very well, where he calls precisely the sort of nativism that she's abetting the secret of the impotence of the English working class. <laughs> it, it, and, and it was the, mind blowing the interesting... that she quoted that. <laughs> It is, uh, but it's also, I mean, that is, that passage, uh, and indeed that essay, marks a serious turn in the history of the left. Uh, and indeed, uh, it marks um, the consolidation of the left as a distinct, because prior to that, the left uh, and the right hadn't fully formed yet, I would argue, um, or at least um, that in the, in the late 19th century, there were still elements of the left where it was... Um, uh, perfectly respectable to be anti-Semitic, for example. Right? So there had to be a clarification. Uh, and later on, there was a clarification on imperialism and Lenin's whole argument about imperialism and the arguments of the Zimmerwald left relied a lot upon what Marx said uh, in that essay um, for, in terms of its methodological approach. It's worth noting that before that, Marx, uh, and to a much greater extent Engels, had been ferociously racist um, uh, towards different groups of people. Uh, Engels uh, be, uh, celebrating the Mexican-American war uh, on the basis that, you know, Mexicans are lazy, um, they're not going to um, build up civilization, be a good thing for them if America wins, uh, supporting the colonization of Algerians and the defeat of the Algerians and so on. Um, so, the, I mean, 
uh, that the, the citation of that specific passage, uh, which marks a turning point in the development of historical materialism, as distinct from bourgeois ideology, as distinct from social democratic ideology, uh, or what we would today call social democratic ideology, the various forms of, um, you know, nationalist, uh, reformist politics, as distinctively revolutionary, internationalist, um, and socialist credo. Uh, it, it's it's baffling that the, that came up there. But it, it to be honest, it also reminds me of... Um, uh, you know, the habit of contrarian journalists of quoting Marx on this or that um, without really understanding what Marx was saying. I mean, you know, Hitchens used to quote Marx on religion, um, had no idea what Marx was saying about religion. So, I mean, this is uh, in that tradition. Um, I think I think Nagel, um, at, at her worst, uh, can be an incredibly um, lazy writer, to be honest. Someone who certainly can't be misunderstood on this subject in the history of the American left was Lenin, who was, of course, extraordinarily critical of socialists for embracing war. Everyone knows that, but also for anti-immigrant politics. And he cited both as instances of opportunism. Can, Can you say a little bit about what Lenin and other communists meant by opportunism and and why it was that nationalism, whether manifest in the question of immigration or war, were seen as so dangerously inimical to socialism? I mean, I think opportunism involves prioritizing short-term gains over long-term strategic commitments. So it's not a question of uh, moralism, uh, but it's simply this. Your long-term strategic commitment is to the overthrow of capitalism and the uh, creation of a socialist society. Uh, In the interest of gaining um, a short-term advantage, uh, you make you pander to uh, racist sentiment or nativist sentiment um, and you hope to build some support on that basis but in doing so you're weakening the conditions for the long-term success of your overall socialist agenda right so i mean uh, that i think is uh, pretty straightforward nationalism they were uh, of course writing at a time when nationalism meant uh, european uh, sort of socialists identifying with their national state um, and mobilizing uh, with their national state in lethal, uh, murderous wars. Uh, it's astonishing to think about it how quickly the German SPD went from in the event of war, we're going to have general strikes, we're going to protest, we're not going to put up with this, uh, to voting for war credits and uh, waging a ferocious. Uh, war within against critics and lining up as much as possible within their own distinctive idiom uh, with the uh, intensified jingoistic nationalism of uh, the the state at the time. This is what they were up against. But they also were gradually learning, thanks to delegates from the international at Stuttgart in 1907 and so on, uh, that colonial nationalism was uh, it, its own kind of toxic poison. Uh, and they were gr- gradually becoming aware, although it really took uh, anti-colonial revolutionaries like Aimé Césaire and Frantz Fanon and so on to, to really drive this home, that actually this form of nationalism was always being practiced and that the forms of uh, racist, exclusionary, militaristic and violent, murderous politics that uh, tore Europe apart had already been practiced upon much of the world in the course of uh, colonization and colonial state building. So uh, there was a a history of um, developing awareness of the role of race and nationalism Uh, in the organization of ruling class politics and in the constitution of violent structures of rule uh, in the form of modern states. It seems to me that we've come to a stage today where there's quite a large chunk of the left who thinks that under neoliberalism, the state, uh, you know, has somehow uh, gradually withered away. You know, it's as if we've reached the higher phase of communism. (laughs) Which is hilarious because these are people just taking neoliberalism's ad copy at face value. Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, uh, the size of the state uh, in neoliberal economies, it hasn't shrunk at all. I mean, it's it's you could argue that uh, spending is flatlined, but it hasn't shrunk uh, 
I mean, even after years of austerity in Britain, the size of the state is not significantly lower than it was, say, in uh, the years of Thatcher. Or, and this is because a neoliberal economy needs a big interventionist state. The early neoliberals were very clear on this point, um, that, uh, and especially the German order liberals, that there was no way you could have. They didn't believe in homo economicus. They didn't believe that people were intrinsically predisposed to truck barter and trade. They believed that you needed a state to make people behave in that way and to constitute markets. Um, and so that's why it's important to have uh, such regulatory structures as just to cite an example in the UK, compulsory competitive tendering, which basically means that local states, uh, sorry, local councils, when they have um, a service they want to provide, they have to tender it out to the most competitive uh, bidder. Um, and this is uh, a classically neoliberal intervention. And then, of course, you've got to take into account that uh, many of the um, beneficiaries of the neoliberal state are the clients um, who get massive public-private uh, partnership contracts um, and drive up the costs of uh, spending on this or that service, uh, thanks to their profits, pure rent-seeking. And many of those companies, of course, depend upon uh, cheap migrant labour. So the reorganisation of the state under neoliberalism, we've seen over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, has seen it in increase its repressive capacities, uh, has seen it increase uh, in both the United States and the United Kingdom, increase its incar incarceration capacities, um, has seen it uh, extend webs of uh, repression in terms of dealing with social undesirables, constituting new groups of people as deviants, um, locking people up more, driving the homeless off the streets, and of course, Within that context, the intensified regulation of migration is part of that. And it's within this framework uh, of the liberal state promoting nationalism and racism and exclusionary measures that has generated uh, a renewed uh, and empowered far right that has grown uh, to a level that we haven't seen in the post-war era. And left case for anti-immigrant politics, you write, is really attached to this idea that they're being, quote, realists, these people who are soberly confronting an issue that the rest of us on the radical left, too caught up in our humanitarian daydreaming or whatever, refuse to earnestly reckon with. But you write, quote, one thing that one really can't say about them, and you're talking about uh, the Wagon Acton Company, is that one thing that they really can't say about them is that they've driven refugees down the political agenda. It may not be the issue they spend the most time talking about, but it is the issue that defines them as distinct from their opponents on the left. And I think that's a really important point because it's one thing for us on the left to offer workers a concrete alternative to the far right, that workers should fight their bosses rather than fellow workers who happen to be migrants. But I think your point is is really important here, which is that left anti-immigrant politics, and fortunately, I don't really think they exist in the U.S. in the way that they may in Europe. I think Nagel's a bit lacking a constituency here, thankfully. Um, but the way that they function is to simply ratify the population that immigrants are a central problem. And strategically speaking, morally speaking aside, strategically speaking, that's a disaster because we can't uh -huh. win on right-wing terrain. And that's something that the right always seems to understand pretty well the importance of resetting the terms of the debate to terms that they will win on. If voters are told by all sides that immigration is a problem, then they'll go with the real deal, which is the far right. And yeah. this isn't just like a hypothesis. This is precisely what decades of, in the U.S. at least, liberal triangulation on immigration has demonstrated. I mean, that that's uh, one of the most striking things about this. These um, daring um, uh, defiers of orthodoxy are just reiterating decades of liberal triangulation. Uh, we've seen this strategy deployed before. It's not new in the history of social democracy and certainly of third-way social democracy uh, and certainly of uh, third-way uh, democratic politics in the United States. Uh, it's not new at all to appropriate the language and policies of the uh, hard nativist right on immigration. So what they're doing here, um, uh, they're, they're um, 
uh, uh, daring us to be uh, astonished uh, and stunned into silence by something that we've seen before and that has, on its own terms, repeatedly failed. Um, I would just say that uh, you know, when it comes to uh, the uh, arguments of uh, these people claiming to be sober realists facing the facts and so on, the weakness of their political economy I mean, uh, the absolute mess of uh, their commentary on political economy, um, insofar as it exists at all. I mean, by and large, their argument takes place on exactly the terrain of identity politics that they deride. Um, but insofar as they talk about it at all, um, it, it's uh, very thin. And I would say that that's uh, an artifact of the ways in which, certainly for the Negolites, um, they are uh, structured into uh, a sort of online reaction economy. I mean, that's what this is really all about, uh, as far as, you know, Nagel writes something uh, that is designed to get people's goats. And to some extent, it's also a reaction against um, uh, the new left within the democratic socialists uh, in the United States of America. Um, you know, um, there's a, a feeling that they're too ultra left, they're too moralistic, they're proposing policies that are unrealistic and so on. And uh, therefore, these people, rather than uh, focusing on how they might best advance the left, are focusing on how they might best um, organize uh, a constituency to purge the left of these ultras and uh, reconcile uh, the left with normies, as they call them. Um, Which is done in the name with, of this sort of caricatured workerism that poses yeah. as a form of radicalism, which is really sort of just hiding what is actually a fairly right social democratic nationalist project? The working class isn't an ethnicity. It isn't um, a, a sort of um, a, a nostalgic tea towel memory. The working class is a, 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 a relationship. Uh, you are a working class if you happen to be in a particular relationship with the, mean, the owners of the means of production. And to identify the working class with a culture uh, or with an ethnicity, or with a set of political valences, or with a, some idea of uh, normality that uh, belongs in a Norman Rockwell painting, uh, I think is uh, obviously uh, intrinsically stupid. Um, and this is the other thing. Um, we are, unfortunately, uh, because of, as I mentioned, the, the sort of online reaction economy, um, structurally determined to be stupider than we need to be uh, <laughs> i think I, I think it would be beneficial for us not to react quickly to anything uh insofar as it's possible um to take our time because quick reactions are rarely the kinds of reactions that you actually want um and uh, uh certainly um insofar as the um uh, sort of social media debates and so on. There are too many people who uh, love the ripples of outrage um, uh, and the the effective economies that are bound up with that. I just suggest a, a massive, uh, unimpressed yawn and raise of the eyebrow when it comes to this uh, cheap stuff from, uh, in this case, Angela Nagel. The issue of sort of this wor workerist caricature. You you write that that Wagonex and company explain their position by way of not their own prejudices, but what they patronizingly describe as ordinary people's base prejudices, which which reminded me of this line from Frederick, Friedrich Hayek, who wrote, ordinary man only slowly reconciles himself to a large increase of foreigners among his neighbors, even if they differ only in language and manners, and that therefore the wise statesman to prevent an unpleasant reawakening of primitive instincts, ought to aim yeah. at keeping the rate of influx low. Well, what do you make of this sort of dismal fatalism about working class political subjectivities in terms of its origins and implications that seems to inform a lot of this left xenophobia? Perhaps I could situate my answer partly in personal experience. I grew up in uh, the Protestant part of Northern Ireland. I was recently there um, just uh, visiting. And uh, one of the things that struck me about it is that, um, of course, there is a, a baseline social conservatism uh, in this part of uh, the United Kingdom. 
not all of it, but in large parts of it. Um, and, you know, certainly growing up in that context, you can't buy into any notion of the working class as salt of the earth. But even there, um, there are progressive movements, there are working class militants, there are pro-migrant uh, ca campaigns and communities, and there is a, a slow social liberalization of attitudes taking place. And I would say that, and also by, you know, I mean, it's also worth, um, in the texture of everyday experience, uh, and you notice this a lot in the north of England uh, and Northern Ireland, no, the northern parts of Britain where it's very working class, but the parts that are very homogenous, there is a grassroots day-to-day -day kind of solidarity, a kindness, a friendliness. But kindness can also be uh, a form of uh, solidarity with people like me, with people like us. So it can lend itself to a kind of um, aversion. And I would say that it's aversive racism that you get there rather than supremacist racism. On the other hand, having also lived in London for 20 years, uh, you know, where the majority are working class and it's a multi-ethnic working class city, um, and having traveled up and down England um, to, in various cities, you can also see the other side of this, which is that, uh, you know, there's a sort of a taken for granted anti-racism. There's a taken for granted, uh, I think um, Paul Gilroy describes it as a multiculture. You know, it's not multiculturalism as an agenda. It's just taken for granted that your neighbours uh, will be black, white, Asian or whatever. And that this is uh, not intrinsically any more interesting than the idea that they have blue eyes or brown eyes or whatever. And then there's this sort of idea that people um, have this intrinsic um, uh, hostility towards people from an out group. And that uh, is more rooted in a kind of, in the UK context, neo-powerlism, you know, the idea that uh, they may not believe in biological differences, but there is a, a delicate, precious cultural hierarchy, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, people are... Um, in which people are um, dedicated to preserving their own cultural in-group. Um, I would say that intellectuals who make this argument about other people are rather like those people who answer opinion polls about racism, who will never admit to their own racism, but will always admit to the racism of their neighbours. You know, it's, it's like you, they, 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 the, the opinion polls classically find that they will say, uh, you know, oh, do you think you're a racist? No, no, no. Well, do you think your neighbors are racist? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's very racist. And it's a bit like uh, this uh, This with these commentators. They're projecting. Uh, I, I think that they're conjuring up this figure of the uh, working class, you know, the worker who is um, very simple, driven by base material uh, impulses, um, uh, no nonsense, has none of these silly cultural thr thrills, isn't interested in um, hippie transgressions and being trans this and uh, being multi-ethnic that. They, they're they very straightforward and, and you just have to give them better wages and that's the, you know, this is a very, very conservative social democratic approach. I mean, it's not even social democratic, but it's a very, very conservative kind of reformism. And uh, as I say, I think that it's projecting uh, a racist agenda um, that one doesn't want to take responsibility for. Lenin, in fact, to bring him up again, uh, argued that migration was the sort of force that could break down these sort of barriers. He wrote, only reactionaries can shut their eyes to the progressive significance of this modern migration of nations. Emancipation from the yoke of capital is impossible without the further development of capitalism, without the class struggle that is based on it. And it is into mm -hmm. this struggle that capitalism is drawing the masses of the working people of the whole world, breaking down the musty, fusty habits of local life, breaking down national barriers and prejudices, uniting workers from all countries in the huge in huge factories and mines in America, Germany, and so forth. And so rather than seeing people's ideologies and prejudices as as somehow set in stone and thus I guess implicitly biologically determined, we have to place ideology into historical and political economic context and see how new experiences and new conditions can transform the way people think about the world. 
I would sort of qualify uh, Lenin's comments somewhat, given that, I mean, that kind of globalized capitalism uh, also produces uh, all sorts of pathological and toxic effects. Um, so it's, a, I think, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I I think what we're getting at here is that we have to have a strategic approach to real historical tendencies. Uh, so there are real historical tendencies in terms of the globalization of capital and how do we situate ourselves within them to exploit them in order to maximize the class capacities to overcome capitalism. Um, and so I think, obviously, if your focus is on obtaining a government, uh, you know, uh, control of office, for a, a, a relatively leftist program, but one framed within the nation. Um, and when I say relatively leftist, I mean sort of leftist in the Fabian sense, you know, uh, a degree of public ownership and some degree of redistribution, but framed within the nation and framed very much within the state and very much as a top, uh, top-down uh, kind of program. Uh, well, sure, then it makes sense that you aren't particularly interested in how to enhance the class capacities of this or that group of workers and sort of international solidarity is not really that interesting or indeed might seem to be a kind of uh, ideological obsession of uh, a few anarchists and revolutionaries. Um, on the other hand, um, if you are trapped within that framework, it does tend to result in very poor analysis. And the fact that it results in such poor analysis, that is at such considerable variance with the facts and the established empirical data, should be a reason um, to reconsider it um, and maybe reconsider one's politics. You write that, quote, Wagonect and her allies think Delinka is out of touch with its traditional supporters, the older, mm -hmm. less educated manual workers in the East who voted AFD are not reached by squeaky clean, sanctimonious middle-class activists crying about dead refugees. It, Nagel makes a similar argument that the American left is sort of run by white-collar professionals who are losing working-class voters to the right because the left refuses to address immigration. What what do you make of their argument that it is the one of the central tasks of the left to win the base of the right over to its side. The thing about this is that there has always been a working class right, particularly in the what you in Leninist stadium would call imperialist economies. You know, um, the, in Britain, uh, there has never been less than a third of the working class that has voted conservative. Uh, I don't know what the situation is like in the United States exactly because it's uh, it's a very different context. You've got two capitalist parties. Um, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, they, they, there's hardly, I mean, very large numbers of workers don't even bother to vote. But I would guess that uh, the Republicans have some working class base um, and not an insignificant one. So um, uh, it's always been the case that there have been groups of workers who are uh, uh, open to right-wing arguments and more open to right-wing arguments and to left-wing arguments. It's worth looking into some of the reasons why that is. But if you were to look at, say, the two 2016 um, outcomes, uh, po political outcomes, uh, the, the Brexit vote in Britain and the Trump vote in the United States, you can see very clearly how this is panning out. It's not the core of the organized working class that is turning to the right. It is um, the parts of the working class that are cut off uh, from centers of uh, financial, communicative, um, and uh, informational power, political power, and so on, uh, and are very provincialized. And uh, they are just... And to our white. Yeah, oh, oh, indeed, of course. Uh, uh, not exclusively, it has to be said, uh, no. given s some of what happened in 2016. But yeah, I mean, there was quite a, a sizable, surprisingly big uh, black vote for Brexit. Um, there is a degree of uh, black anti-immigrant sentiment in the United Kingdom. I mean, and the United States. But you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. Whiteness can't be um, uh, discounted as a factor here. And we should, uh, we should think seriously about what that means. But uh, what I was trying to get at here was that there are certain ways in which uh, working class experience can be lived because being working class in itself is not it's not a program it's not uh, a, a definite 
fixed set of experience. It, it, it diverges nationally, regionally, according to religion, according to race and so on. So you're talking about uh, older groups of white workers, largely in what are called skilled occupations, uh, who have experienced declining social position for the last 30 or 40 years um, and who are um, in quite provincial areas. Um, and or, or another th factor that makes a difference in the United Kingdom is housing. If you've got access to stable housing, chances are um, you're and, and you're in one of these provincial areas. Chances are you have a traditional family. Uh, that's you know th some of these factors pull together without and also without trade union organisation. That's also very important. Uh, all of that taken together is uh, the sort of um, basis for a traditionalist working class right, um, because if you have a certain stake in the system, it doesn't have to be. Um, that you're not being exploited. Of course, you're still being exploited, but you're being exploited and, and you still manage to have a house. Um, then that can be a basis for a certain kind of conservatism. With that, combined with local government policies of segregated housing and a degree of segregation in schooling, you get a racialization of the local polity. And with uh, you, uh, you can you can combine that with uh, police action, uh, stigmatizing and targeting young Asian uh, males, uh, blaming them for being part of gangs, blaming them for uh, pushing drugs and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, typical cop ideology. Um, and uh, what you ended up with was the sort of situation that resulted in a series of riots in northern towns and cities in the United Kingdom around 2000, 2001. Uh, with the result of a, an upsurge of support for the racist right among many white workers there, BNP, uh, British National Party, a, a neo-fascist party doing very well. And I'm just describing some of the concrete details of this kind of politics, this kind of racist uh, class politics, um, so that you can see that uh, it's it's not intrinsically the pro uh, a problem of the left failing to talk the language of racists, it is rather uh, a deeper set of historical protests, process, uh, processes where the left and the labour movement have been decimated and where uh, local political structures have undertaken a racialized turn in policy making and in ideology, uh, particularly linked with the rise of third way politics in uh, British Labour Party and local labour labor authorities. And of course, what you get uh, is the incubation of the racist right. I want to ask you about that on the European level as 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 a whole, looking back at the economic crisis and the austerity regimes that followed, how do you see the political economic context in perhaps different ways contributing to heightened xenophobia in northern, southern and eastern Europe? I think you're right to break it up actually between north, south, and east, um, because that's uh, quite a neat way of um, formatting um, uh, the different tendencies. So in the south, uh, you've seen uh, the um, rise of anti-immigrant right rightist politics um, within the context of austere regimes, which are increasingly uh, post-democratic. Um, and uh, so you saw that in Italy uh, under Matteo Renzi. Uh, you saw the uh, Italian centre promote anti-immigrant politics as a way of trying to usurp the um, initiative of the far right while pushing austerity politics and while undermining undermining the uh, legitimacy of the national state and of the you know the existing broadly liberal establishment. Um, and the result was, of course, that uh, the uh, coalition of the Lega Nord and the Five Star Movement took power um, and started brutalizing immigrants, uh, uh, you know, in an unprecedented way. But, you know, the, the, they, they are, uh, as with Trump in the United States, they are radicalizing existing tendencies in policy. That's one zone. Uh, then if you look out to Eastern Europe, it's... Uh, it's less a question of austerity than it is of national um, post-communist uh, administrations, 
uh, lurching further and further to the right, largely on questions that have to do with the EU's uh, uh, things like uh, human rights laws, uh, uh, environment laws, and things like that. So Poland, for example, would like to gain a competitive, uh, or the Polish uh, right-wing government would like to pursue a competitive national advantage um, uh, in uh, polluting industries um, or environmentally destructive industries um, and finds uh, the EU's regulations to be uh, a problem there. And then, of course, in the uh, north, uh, it's it's less, again, it's, it's less a matter of austerity, though there have been austerity uh, uh, programs uh, unfolded, but they've been nothing like as severe as in uh, Portugal, Italy, uh, Greece, uh, Spain, and so on. It really is fundamentally a question of state legitimacy and democracy. The democratic capacities of national states across Europe have been eroded for a long time. This is not um, uh, primarily caused, in my opinion, by the European Union. The European Union is simply the most uh, entrenched expression of this post-democratic system, uh, wherein national states have essentially rooted a lot of their policy making through these closed decision-making centres, like, for example, the European Commission, which is a jumped up civil service, um, and essentially have removed a lot of uh, decision making power from uh, even the exiguous democratic oversight that has hitherto been possible within capitalist democracies. Um, and so uh, the collapse of legitimacy of these institutions across Europe, and you can see it in every single survey, there's a collapse of legitimacy of national governments, of national institutions, of uh, the police, of the army, of uh, banks, of big business, and so on. Um, and I think that uh, politicians uh, like you know Merkel, um, uh, who is a very good um, uh, exploiter of uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, uh, like Theresa May, obviously, who has a terrible record on this. Um, and even Macron, who was supposed to be some sort of liberal um, on this kind of issue. Um, I think that uh, they are uh, resorting to this idea of a kind of national community all pulling together in the face of the stresses and strains of uh, 21st century capitalism and, you know, all the problems of global competition. And uh, the idea of all being in it together, of course, re requires some sort of baseline of solidarity, uh, you know, for that to make sense. So the baseline of solidarity, this um, uh, non-class solidarity is... Um, tends to be uh, the, the the sort of um, citizenship uh, that's rooted in uh, the national state, and so that that I think is uh, is what's happening here. I'm Naomi Klein. You're listening to the Dig as well. You should be, and you can support them on Patreon.com. This episode of the Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Verso Books which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for dig listeners like you. One that you might like is City of Segregation, 100 Years of Struggle for Housing in Los Angeles by Andrea Gibbons. City of Segregation documents 100 years of struggle against the enforced separation of racial groups through property markets, constructions of community, and the growth of neoliberalism. This movement history covers the decades of work to end legal support for segregation in 1948, the 1960 civil rights movement and CORE's effort to integrate LA's white suburbs, and the 2006 victory, preserving 10,000 downtown residential hotel units from gentrification, enfolded with an ongoing resistance to the criminalization and displacement of the homeless. Andrea Gibbons reveals the shape and nature of the racist ideology that must be fought in Los Angeles and across the United States if we hope to found just cities. City of Segregation, 100 Years of Struggle for Housing in Los Angeles by Andrea Gibbons, out now from Verso Books. Do you think that this sort of red-brown politics is a real possibility in Europe, or is it just more of a of a marginal provocation? Because as we've discussed, xenophobic politics always requires a political coalition with a social base that's inherently reactionary and hostile to the left because it's a cross-class 
nationalist coalition where mm-hmm. native born workers allegiance is to their hierarchical superiors rather than to fellow workers but in the US I don't think it's possible because immigration politics have become incredibly polarized and there's simply not a, not a real social base period for for a left xenophobia there's xenophobia on the the right and pro immigrant rights sentiment on the left and in many ways Nagel's argument is a distraction because of the impossibility of translating her her argument into a actual program but but in Europe it seems like there's perhaps more of a possibility including one could argue the Italian coalition government being in some ways an instantiation of of a red brown coalition I see what you mean by that um I mean certainly uh five star movement is not straightforwardly um, a reactionary coalition, although I would say the balance uh, of uh, its politics uh, became increasingly reactionary over the years, and obviously racism was always there as a th- as a thread and became increasingly prevalent. Um, and you know, its uh, its social base has become more and more right wing. But I see exactly what you're saying there. There is, a- or with the pact with Salvini, the league would be sort of the the brown and the yeah. five star would be kind of red or orange or something i don't know <laughs> well I, you could you could you could argue that five star is a, a germinal uh, form of the red brown coalition itself yeah you know? yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but but here's the thing um we are at a very early stage in the development of uh, a series of tendencies that are going to mature in the coming years so we should be um uh, cautious about being too certain about what we say about this but i think that there are tendencies um, in um, what I sort of tend to call the politics of the shitstorm. That is the <laughs> tendency for um, the emergence of leaderless movements um, uh, built around um, specific um, antagonisms or grievances um, where uh, the far right has some role or agency. And you can see this in uh, with the um, fuel protests in France. They're not straightforwardly reactionary, uh, from what I hear. Uh, I mean, we obviously wait for the detail on that, but there, there are a complicated series of ideological elements. There, Macron are some, is painting them as as such, though. Of course, he is, and uh, we know exactly why he would do that. Um, he depends upon his enemy being fascist. That's the only way he's in office. Uh, if if it wasn't for the fact that he was the uh, maneuvered into position uh, with the help of the media and the political establishment as the alternative to fascism, he wouldn't be where he is. Nonetheless, you could see how um, uh, these kinds of movements, which are uh, sort of enabled by new communications technologies um, because there's no need for a mediating political organization if all you want to do is kick off uh, over a specific issue and uh, you can have um, a sort of congregation of forces, a swarm of forces uh, around a series of um, uh, geographical areas. Uh, and it, uh, it only needs to be organized around a baseline or a certain agreed sentiment, which, you know, I mean, at the time of Occupy, this looked relatively progressive because everybody could say, well, Occupy, you know, uh, we're in favor of um, uh, more democracy. We don't want the bankers to have control of everything. But even then, there were already reactionary elements uh, sort of burrowed into the Occupy movement, even though it was overwhelmingly a leftist uh, sort of uh, coalition. Um, But I think that you could see uh, situations emerge in which in practice, there would be a fusion of leftish and rightish elements. And you can see um, around Syria, um, and I know that this is a, a, a whole uh, can of worms uh, that I'm opening up here, but uh, there are certain tendencies where uh, elements of the left end up um, going so far because of their opposition to U.S. imperialism, they end up denying any crimes committed by Assad and, you know, blaming everything on the opposition, the uh, insurrection. and uh, To the it, point where anti-imperialism becomes Assadism indistinguishably. And they end up uh, sort of hanging out with some dubious uh, right wing uh, and sometimes uh, almost fascistic figures and so on. So you can see the tendencies where that can emerge. And uh, I 
I would say that it's it's an open question. Uh, to to your specific point about the difference between European politics and U.S. politics, uh, it's um, a very recent thing, in my opinion, that uh, American politics, American left politics, has become quite civilized on the question of migration, and that's a result of the big m- migrant strike in two thousand six. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think after that, it it just became totally incoherent uh, to maintain an anti-immigrant position and be on the left. Uh, the problem in Britain is that thus far, the um, uh, several million migrant workers have not been organised uh, uh, as a labour movement or as a political tendency. They weren't allowed to vote uh, in the um, uh, Brexit referendum, obviously. Uh, so they're uh, they're not really an empowered group within uh, the UK, um, and uh, you know. Uh, there are Polish shops, certainly, but there's no real representation for uh, migrant workers in the UK. So it's uh, it's easy for uh, leftists uh, to become confused on this issue and to think they're being really tough um, and tough minded by talking about the need for, um, you know, to stop, uh, as uh, Nagel puts it, the importation of cheap labour. Um, which is a really dehumanising phrase that I wish people on the left would stop using. Um, I I, th- I think that um, if we had uh, in Europe a series of migrants movements, and in France to some extent you have seen that, you've seen that with the Saint Papier, but uh, that was um, you know organised by um, uh, I think people like God, I'm going to forget his name now, um, the sociologist. Ah, never mind. But uh, you've seen you've seen sort of uh, uh, sort of incipient movements like that. But we really need uh, for the left, uh, for the uh, uh, the militant um, international swing of the left and the labour movement to try and uh, uh, open up their doors uh, to uh, migrant workers to extend offers of solidarity, resources, help to listen to what they want. Um, to listen to their agenda, um, and obviously uh, that's you know not going to result in uh, an immediate payoff, a payoff tomorrow. But you could see how over time uh, that would begin to uh, delegitimize um, the sort of anti-immigrant ideology on the left. I think an- another thing that would make a big difference, uh, by the way, is that. In the UK, a lot of anti-racism is deflected through the campaign to remain within the European Union. Um, Yes, I think that's I think that's catastrophic. Um, It's sort of like mainstream liberal remain remainerism. Yeah, and you you can absolutely see why that is the case because the answer to the limitations of the European Union is not fortress Britain and it's not little Britain racism. And if that if that's the only alternative, then yeah, of course people are going to think, well, Jesus, let's just defend what we've got. But uh, I think it would be a better idea if the energy that was put into trying to stay within the European Union was dedicated to on that specific issue to defending the only really defensible part of the European Union, which is uh, the system of free movement, um, and demanding that it be in fact radicalised and that refugees be permitted into Europe without uh, uh, these illegal pushbacks, without the system of detention centres, um, that they be stripped back, and uh, indeed demanding that Britain strip away its uh, historical uh, uh, anti-Commonwealth migration laws, which are basically laws against black people moving here. I mean, it's ridiculous that we have these laws on the books, and we do. Um, So there are a number of things that could be done. And if the left was to fight on these things, for example, within the Labour Party, I'm convinced that they could be won within the Labour Party, and if they became Labour Party policy, that would change the whole conversation and give confidence to the anti-racist left. Let me ask you more uh, about that. Jeremy Corbyn has a history of staunchly pro-migrant politics, but according to an essay I read by Barnaby Rain in Salvage, he has recently shifted gears. And I want to quote from the essay, quote, seeding ground on immigration is not new on the left, and paradoxically, Moments of strength, when the left's arguments begin to cut through, as happened in the last general election, only increase the temptation to drop our own commitments opportunistically as electoral prizes come into view. 
what does the political landscape on migration look like right now in the UK? Because obviously we're in the midst of a Brexit debate with freedom of movement at the very center. And there was also a huge scandal earlier this year for Theresa May's government over deporting long resident Caribbean migrants, which uh, the so-called Windrush generation. Apropos the Windrush generation, this uh, is a straightforward case of um, the um, government of the day introducing, basically uh, destroying the paperwork that proved that uh, these uh, individuals, uh, you know, were British citizens and had the right to citizenship, and then subsequently changing citizenship laws, and uh, with the result of um, a lot of people who've lived here um, legally uh, for decades, generations. Um, being subject to violence, um, being subject to deportation. Uh, it's its a really terrible, tawdry, shameful thing that's happened. And uh, it was uh, done as a logical emanation of the government's uh, drive to other and demonize and penalize migrants. Um, and I s- sort of think that uh, it reflects um, a model uh, of... Um, uh, sort of racist sovereignty that may uh, be gradually becoming passe anyway. But um, as regards the um, specific character of the debates on uh, immigration in Britain today, um, one of the problems has been that the left has um, by and large been quite pusillanimous on this. And that's uh, in large part to do with the fact that for a long time there wasn't a left to speak of. What what uh, most people understood as the left was the Labour Party, and the Labour Party uh, had cleaved to the centre-right. And even uh, when Ed Miliband took the leadership of the Labour Party back in 2010 and promised a, a mild tilt to the left, you know, opposing austerity and all the rest of it. I really like Rain's comment, line on Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband spent five sad years as Labour leader devoid of his faith in politics. He was no neoliberal shill but he tried to fit social democracy to an austerity banner woven by the right and his lack of ambition killed him at the ballot box. I mean, the interesting thing about this is that he did actually drive up the Labour vote in England, but because of uh, the alliance with the Conservatives in Scotland, uh, devastated um, the Labour Party in uh, Scotland 2015, as I think you know. Um, but in terms of um, how he ran that campaign, uh, he campaigned to the right of the Scottish National Party on things like austerity and nuclear weapons, but he also ran a campaign, one of whose major planks was more border controls, uh, tougher controls on immigration. Indeed, they issued a mug with this as a slogan. <laughs> um, yeah, um, sort of one of the great pieces of memorabilia from that campaign. Um, sad to say uh, that's been the default on um in the British Labour Party, um, certainly, I, I don't think it would have been the default um, uh, in the sort of 1980s or early 1990s, but it's been the default since uh, the peak new Labour period. Um, and it was part of um, Gordon Brown's authoritarian Britishness agenda. And there was always a socially conservative wing of the, of the new Labour right anyway. So uh, that's been part of the problem. Uh, the, the, the whole debate has been driven to the right by um, the Labour Party and the Labour leadership. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, um, uh, at, on the first day uh, of uh, taking the leadership of the Labour Party, went down to a refugee rights rally in central London and spoke at it. Absolutely characteristic of him uh, at a time when it was re- it was assumed that this was uh, an unpopular thing to do. He just went ahead and did it. By and large... Jeremy Corbyn's statements on immigration have been acceptable. They've been okay. Um, he's avoided saying anything for most of the time um, uh, offensive. Um, you know, in terms of as a Labour leader, um, that's that's a that's not a bad record. But he, uh, in negotiating with uh, his parliamentary party, um, has um, and particularly since uh, the Brexit vote, has accepted the idea that it would be electorally untenable for Labour to be enthusiastically defending free movement because Labour um, 
certainly the left Remain campaign, which was headed up by Corbyn and McDonnell um, uh, and fronted by Yanis Varoufakis, defended free movement. You know, it's like, we we want to defend free movement, we want to defend refugees' rights. Um, a perfectly reasonable uh, leftist position. But then the Brexit re- result happened and it showed that about a third of the uh, Labour vote had gone behind Brexit and a lot of it was driven by anti-immigrant sentiment. And uh, gradually Corbyn uh, started to say things like, well, we're not wedded to free movement, you know. But even then, uh, and even in the context of arguments about uh, importing cheap labor and so on, um, he's tended to um, uh, resist the um, pressure to, for example, commit to uh, reducing immigrants to a certain arbitrary figure or indeed to commit to reducing immigration at all. Uh, he has resisted the uh, uh, pressure to blame immigrants for any uh, sort of social problems or for low wages and all that. So I give him credit for that much, but still, I think he's being very um, defensive um, at best, uh, and I think that he's being very timid, um, and he could afford to be uh, brave on this, because I don't think that the people who voted Labour in 2017, um, by and large, I don't think those are people who... Uh, really, I mean, believed that Jeremy Corbyn in his heart was uh, the hammer of immigration. I think they believed that he was a politically correct anti-racist leftist with a history of anti-racist campaigning and refugee rights campaigning and all the rest of it. And they voted for him either because of that or in spite of that. Is there space for a pro-migrant Lexit or, or must socialists fight, as Varoufakis argues, for change within the EU, in part because the push to exit the EU is very much under the control politically of far-right xenophobes. Is there a way to exit on pro-migrant left terms? This is the problem. Brexit happened in the context of a debate, um, a campaign and a vote that was uh, a debate between two factions of the right, the neoliberal hard-nosed austerity right and the crazy racist nationalist right. Not an ideal situation. There is a question, therefore, about whether the left is sufficiently developed and strong that it can take control of this situation. My fear uh, is that um, uh, we're going to have to uh, take the risk of uh, Lexit uh, with a pro-immigrant stance even, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the thing about it is, is the Brexit vote has happened. I think it would be a disaster to try and reverse it. I think it would be um, regarded for good reasons uh, and some bad reasons, but mainly for good reasons. If uh, there was an attempt to reverse the vote, uh, it would be regarded as, you know, typical the European Union uh, trying to reverse another referendum it doesn't like uh, the result of. Um, I think it would also um, play into the sort of betrayal narrative of the far right and you know, I mean, practically also, I mean, you think about a referendum, how it would work out. Once again, it would be a debate between uh, two parts of the right, both of whom would dominate the media coverage. And uh, either either way it went would be very bad for the left. Either Brexit would win again and the left would have once again been uh, aligned by and large with the neoliberal centre right um, and thus have been defeated. And that would create an even more triumphalist racist right in the United Kingdom. Or Remain would win. And, uh, you know, basically that would prove there was no alternative to the European Union. There was no alternative to the treaties, uh, to the neoliberal structures and all the rest of it. So I think um, we need to try and shift the uh, argument somewhat. It's no longer, uh, I think, and shouldn't be any longer about do we stay in the European Union or don't we? It's a question of how can we orchestrate the exit from the European Union in such a way that the left is able to take control of it and deliver a Brexit that is um, in the interests of ordinary working class people and that doesn't intensify Britain's already appalling border regime. And um, so concretely, w- is what that would look like Parliament voting down Theresa May's Brexit deal leading to her government 
falling, leading to new elections that Labour would win before the no deal Brexit deadline to renegotiate a better Brexit in Lexit form? Is that the ideal kind of pathway? That can't happen uh, for various reasons. One is uh, I'm pretty sure that May's deal is going to be voted through because there will be a big defection from Labour. I mean, essentially, we're looking at a realignment here um, uh, where uh, on the axis of Brexit, you can see a new centre being formed. Um, and their argument will be, well, the alternative was no deal. So, of course, we had to vote for this uh, this deal. And Theresa May is better than Jeremy Corbyn anyway. Uh, that's what you're going to see. OK, so but even if that doesn't happen, uh, there's no reason why the government should fall. Theresa May might resign. But uh, given the um, Fixed Term Parliaments Act in the United Kingdom, uh, which is a piece of legislation introduced by the last government uh, at the behest of the Liberal Democrats, that's designed to make sure that governments don't fall when they lose legitimacy. It's designed to um, decrease the democratic element of uh, uh, governance and increase the stability of governance. Um, and so that would make it very difficult unless the government decided itself that it wanted to call a general election, um, which is, yeah, exactly. It's highly unlikely. I mean, you can imagine because the, the Tories are a bit crazy at the moment. You can imagine a new, more Brexity leader taking control and saying, we're going to take back our borders, blah, blah, blah. But first, we have to show the country that this Jeremy Corbyn, we're going to crush him. Uh, you can see something like that maybe happening. But. I think it's unlikely. So there's a whole series of reasons why that can happen. But let's say that somehow uh, something uh, that the, the government has voted down, that it does result in a sufficient crisis uh, for the government to fall apart, that it does enable Labour to try to build a coalition to govern, um, which I think would be near impossible, or that it results in Labour, um, you know, a general election, Labour winning and so on. What should a Labour government do? There is, I mean, Farfakis has an interesting argument, and I don't know, uh, you know, I, I can only be tentative about this. But what he says about May's government is this. They made a big mistake by going into a negotiation process, essentially a two-phase negotiation process, um, wherein the European Union's approach was, first, you give me everything I want, and then we can discuss what you want. And as Varoufakis points out, that's not really a negotiation. Uh, that's when you're going to be crushed. And uh, the European Union, uh, as he has every reason to know, doesn't negotiate. He basically insisted on all the things that he wanted. Uh, he had no mandate to negotiate anything, um, uh, that uh, mandate came from Angela Merkel and uh, German government. But um, so essentially, you got a deal that was pretty much uh, the opposite of what Theresa May was claiming that it would be. Barfakis' argument is that the only way to deal with this is to take a solution that doesn't require negotiations. You've got too little time with a two year negotiation process. What you need is uh, what he said was uh, Britain should have taken the off-the-shelf Norway-style um, uh, European economic area model um, for a short period of time, say for five or six years. And then uh, on that basis, uh, Parliament could debate what it wanted to do. You could see um, a left version of that um, because, you know, obviously the problem with that is that it does keep Britain within uh, various treaties. It does keep Britain within the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. And um, so the sort of neoliberal iron cage of bureaucracy remains in place to some extent. Nonetheless, by buying time, for the left to get its shit together, and by proving that Brexit isn't doesn't have to be this huge disaster, which many people fear that it will be, um, and by uh, e enabling the left to um, develop a program for government that could cope with the uh, economic problems that Brexit would undoubtedly bring. I mean, you know, there's there's no question that Brexit would result in the city uh, entering a, a period of decline, uh, depending on how hard the Brexit was um, and that it would require serious economic rebalancing. Well, you know, you could see how something like that could buy time for that to happen. So um, I think uh, that 
there might be a case for, and I say this tentatively, but there might be a case for a kind of left Varoufakisian argument, which is, you know, you you buy time with an EA-style agreement um, that avoids some of the pitfalls of the current arrangement, which is in in many ways uh, even worse than uh, being in the European Union from the point of view of the left. And it would also keep free movement. Um, that's quite important too. Um, and it would enable, uh, and it would be a temporary arrangement too. And you wouldn't have to negotiate it because it's an off-the-shelf off the shelf deal. And that's a possibility. For my last question, I want to zoom way out and ask about something that's rarely mentioned in coverage over the political crisis over migration, which I think is a better phrase than migration crisis um, for reasons that we've discussed. Uh, Something that's rarely discussed is how this all relates and is rooted in deeper issues around Europe coming to terms or failing to come to terms or reckon with or resolve the contradictions of its colonial past and imperial present, including the global North's active role in creating the very migrant pathways that so many in the global North now find to be so alarming. And I think the same is true in the U.S. vis-a-vis settler colonialism. So much of American history was explicitly governed by policies encouraging certain types of white migration, excluding Asian migrants, and subordinating black and Mexican migrants. And I'm I wonder what you think because I I am skeptical that a socialism that socialism or at least socialism that would count as such to us can win either here or there without dealing with these deeply ingrained forms of of domination and exploitation. What do you think? I think it's clear that um some of the main vectors of anti-immigrant politics uh in uh, uh, Europe uh, are predicated on unprocessed colonial desire. If you look at France, for example, what happened there? How did it become the capital of European Islamophobic reaction, uh, as it undoubtedly is today? I mean, crazy stuff. The laws regulating what Muslim women can wear, the state of emergency that they introduced, the ways in which the police targeted Muslim families, um, the ways in which um, uh, Muslim school children were policed. I mean, uh, just absolutely disgraceful and uh, uh, hysterical um, sort of national atmosphere over Islam in general. But uh, the origins of this uh, go back to, um, interestingly, the uh, rightward neoliberal shift of the Mitterrand administration in the early 1980s. And it was particularly at the point where there were strikes in uh, car factories, and most of the strikers were uh, Muslim migrants. And previously, uh, if you talked about uh, sort of um, French migrants from Algeria, or for example, you would tend to uh, talk about Arabs. That would be, that would be the, the designation but uh, my point is that the term, uh, the, the racist uh, sort of starting point would be to identify these people as Arabs. Islam then became an issue because the French government said, well, these strikes are caused by Islamic fundamentalism. And uh, this is a republic. And we don't have that kind of fundamentalism here. And you can't understand how that move worked without looking at the history of French republicanism and how it emerged as an ideology of empire and uh, how it emerged as an ideology of how to civilize um, these various societies overseas. So republicanism uh, uh, and uh, an idea of uh, secularism called laicite was um, uh, exported throughout the colonies. And in the aftermath of uh, the Second World War and uh, the subsequent colonial wars that French, by and large, uh, the French lost, and the importation, to use Nagel's terms, uh, of a a massive amount of labour from uh, uh, North Africa, for example, well, uh, there you have a situation where that old colonial mission the civilizing mission is rehabilitated as part of a counterinsurgency against a striking labor movement. And from there on, 
uh, you see the national um, conversation and the culture becoming obsessed with uh, is the republic being uh, mined from within by Islam? Is, is, are the Muslims taking over? France has never really confronted its uh, colonial past to the extent that it was actually controversial when Emmanuel Macron, uh, as part of burnishing his liberal credentials, uh, described colonial crimes of humanity. It was like, uh, where, where is this coming from? How dare you? Um, that has never really been faced up to, even on the French left. And that's why the French left uh, is so, um, by and large, uh, so obliviously um, Islamophobic, um, even if not as uh, overtly uh, uh, and such a toxic way as the right. Um, uh, and uh, in Britain, too, of course, you know, the um, uh, history of uh, migrant baiting in Britain is linked to uh, what happened when Britain lost its control of the uh, colonies. Instead of this ambitious, global, white supremacism, you know, we can rule the world and we have this omnipotence, um, you know, instead of that fantasy, instead you get people wanting to close the gates and saying, well, look, if we can't rule the world, then at least we can rule this little patch of land. Um, and we don't want them coming over here. Yet the contradiction is that white supremacist empire creates the conditions for all of them to come there. Yeah, um, as, as the slogan was, used to be, and I think still is some uh, sometimes, we are here because you were there. Yep. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole series of um, historical determinants which are... Um, I think still active um, uh, culturally, uh, psychologically, um, politically, and they still structure, of course, uh, the economy, the division of labor and the uh, place of uh, formerly colonial states within that international division of labor. That said, I do want to say that we should be, uh, you know, open to the reality that there are major transformations taking place in modes of government, modes of legitimacy. Um, the fact of the the huge fact of the success of largely proletarian black movements against empires, against colonies, against apartheid, against southern segregation, Jim Crow. Um, you know, um, white supremacy was dealt blow after blow after blow in the 20th century, and it you know there there are still uh, racialized hierarchies, of course, um, hugely important, uh, uh, but. Uh, one thing I do want to suggest is that the United States, with its Cockerell system, is actually quite anomalous in the extent to which it maintains a very traditional form of racist sovereignty, you know, very centralized and violent and uh, structured around uh, sort of Gilroy somewhere called re recreational killings by police, you know. And I think that um, in the future, you might see race, uh, racial hierarchies be, being reorganized in different formats. And we should be aware of how that might happen, um, because uh, the danger is that, that if we don't keep up with the change that are taking place, in addition to paying attention to history, uh, that we will um, cease having a strategic purchase on the situation. Richard Seymour, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Richard Seymour is a founding editor of Salvage and the author of many books, including Corbin, The Strange Rebirth of Radical Politics, from Verso. You can find tons of his writing and support his work at patreon.com slash Richard Seymour WTF. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said after noting that xenophobia is the secret of the impotence of the English working class, it is the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week, usually but not always twice. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Logan Dreher. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please do find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes, please leave us a nice review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners. What also does that is you telling other people 
about the show. All propaganda on our behalf is greatly appreciated. And last but not least, do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to keep this thing up and running. Even a few bucks is great. Thank you.